Greetings, Havarim. Again today, Vero Asinyahad is seeking out the truest teachings of the Nazarene faith movement of the first century. And part of that seeking out, which is a seeking out of the physical Yahshua HaMashiach, who lived on earth and still lives on earth, who died and was resurrected in the body, it is imperative that we trace his ways back to their earliest manifestation, that is, the earliest texts, manuscripts, and scrolls that describe his will and his way. It's fine and good to be chasing after the Jesus of faith floating around in the sky or seated at the throne in heaven because we can remold this Jesus into our own image and worship him in a way that pleases us rather than him. But if we can find the historical man, the man who displayed truth before the eyes of the procurator, Pilate, then we find a divine one who can walk with me and talk with me and tell me I'm his own. This is why we at Vero Essen Yohad present difficult teachings and early manuscripts. What we are teaching and what we are publishing through this broadcast is not the Christianity or Judaism of today, but it is the messianic faith of Yeshua, the man, the Messiah, that we go to great lengths to find and to share with you. And we must go to great lengths because those books and texts and manuscripts and scrolls that had to do with him and his have down through the century been destroyed by the very ones who claim him for their master. Yes, this Jesus, he became a threat to the ecclesiastical hierarchy, and he still is. Because what we have found in regards to the real flesh and blood, Yahshua HaMashiach, is that his beliefs and practices and what he taught his followers is nearly diametrically opposed to what the orthodox ecclesiastical cadre in these days teaches. So we present to you today three rare texts that go back to the very beginning of the second century. The first is the fragments of Papias, a Nazarene Israelite who was born about 70 AD and wrote in the early years of the second century. Papias was taught by the apostle Yochanan, John, and he tells us in the fragments of his works, all lost but some quotes, that it was his custom to relate the things he had learned from the apostle and that if anywhere he found a person who knew Yeshua or knew his brothers or successors, that he would hunt those down and ask them what they knew of the master. This is a good thing to do at that time because there was no canon of scripture at all. And you see, Papias was looking for an authentic witness. So we're going to do the fragments from his work that we still have. And then secondly, we have a letter from Ptolemy, a man who was born about 100 AD, writing to his sister Flora about the Torah. Well, that rhymes, Flora Torah. Flora's bamboozled with the laws in the Torah. And she asked the theologian, who was her brother, and he had some very apropos things to say about how Torah was made up, and especially about the interpolations and the detractions in the Torah, making him, it seems, to be the first historical critical scholar of the scriptures. And then finally, we have just as an, as an obscure text as the other two, called The Preaching of Peter in Rome, it gives us the story of how Peter Kipha gets to Rome in the first place and his relationship with the Druid, Linus, whom we read about as Paul greets him in 1 Timothy 4. And of course, Peter is always on the trail of the apostate and founder of the Gnostic faith, Simon Magus. I thought I knew all these texts, but I have just found this one and it's good. And why do we do the Apocrypha? Apocrypha simply means hidden. It's exactly the opposite of the word apocalypse, which means revelation. Apocrypha means hidden. These early documents need to be made known so we can get a better idea of how people believed in the earliest days, so we can emulate that belief. We've already shared lots and lots of Apocrypha with you. I hope that you've enjoyed it. But as you listen, remember we are listening to men and women who lived 2,000 years ago and who, for the most part, 
came out of a very lucrative and very easy paganism into not the type of Christianity we have, affluent Christianity, but to asceticism and poverty and communalism and so many other important isms to learn. And just a reminder, we at the Vero Essen Yahad, we're not Christians, we're not Messianic Jews, we're not rabbinical Jews or Karaites, we are Essenes. We are introducing to you ancient understandings that might go against what you have learned from preachers and YouTube teachers. It's not going to be the same, so don't complain about it. Just listen to it, take what you can, spit the bones out if you will, but understand it will probably be different than your understanding, certainly different than a rabbinical understanding, but one thing's for sure, it will be honest teaching and it will be optimistic teaching. If you can't stand heterodoxy or the belief beliefs of others that come in conflict with your own beliefs or the beliefs of your religious club, then it's best to turn this program off. Why trouble yourself if your mind's made up or listen on in our programs. Challenge yourself. If something doesn't sound right, prove it or let me know about it. I'm meek and lowly of spirit. I will answer your requests, questions, or complaints. Simply write me at veroyahad at gmail.com. Your concerns, I'll address them, and I'll send you a gift or two. So without further ado, let's begin with the Blessed Papias. And here we go. <laughs> As for his life, we really know nothing about Papias apart from what he inferred in his own writings. He's described as an ancient man who was a hearer of John and a companion of Polycarp, described this way by Polycarp's disciple Irenaeus. Eusebius adds that Papias was bishop of Hierapolis, about the time of Ignatius of Antioch, and that is, early 2nd century. In this office, Papia was presumably succeeded by Aberchius of Hierapolis. The name Papias was very common in the region suggesting that he was probably a native of the area. His work is dated by most from about 95 to 120 AD. Later dates were once argued from two references that now appear to be mistaken. One dated Papias' death to around the death of Polycarp in 164. That's actually a mistake. They're mistaking Papilas for Papias. Another unreliable source in which Papias is said to refer to in the, the reign of Hadrian seems to have resulted from confusion between Papias and Quadratus. Eusebius refers to Papias only in his third book and thus seems to date him before the opening of the fourth book in 109. Papias himself knows several New Testament books whose dates are themselves controversial and he was informed by John the Evangelist, the daughters of Philip and many elders who had themselves heard the twelve apostles. He's also called a companion of the long-lived Polycarp as we said before. For all these reasons Papias is thought to have written around the turn of the second century Entry. You might note in the reading that Papias attributes a sayings gospel of Matthew that was written in Hebrew, and he also tells us that Mark was Peter's secretary, and as such he would have kept a journal on the preachings of Peter and the Acts of Peter, but that's never been found. Eusebius concludes from the writings of Papias that he was a Kiliast, understanding the millennium as a literal period in which Messiah will reign on earth, and chastises Papias for his literal interpretation of figurative passages, calling him a man of little intelligence, whose misunderstanding misled Irenaeus and others. On the other hand, Papias is elsewhere said to have understood mystically the Heximeron, that is the six days of creation, as referring to Messiah and the assembly. We can go with Papias on both of those points. He also has an alternative death for Judas. That Judas was so bloated he was not even able to pass through a narrow passageway, and that he was so swollen up that he was hit by a chariot trying to pass through a rather narrow passage. The rest of what he said about Judas' death from his perspective, is almost too obscene to share with you. But he does say, and I will share, that after much agony and punishment, they say, Judas finally died in his own place, and because of the stench, the area is deserted and uninhabitable even now. In fact, to this day, one can't pass that place without holding the nose. So great was the discharge from his body, and so far did it spread over the ground. So, without further ado, let's go to the excerpts from Papias. 
the fragments of Papias from the exposition of the oracles of the Master. The writings of Papias in common circulation are five in number, and these are called an exposition of the oracles of the Master. Irenaeus makes mention of these as the only works written by him in the following words. Now, testimony is borne to these things in writing by Papias, an ancient man, who was a hearer of John and a friend of Polycarp in the fourth of his books, for five books were composed by him. Thus wrote Irenaeus. Moreover, Papias himself, in the introduction to his books, makes it manifest that he was not himself a hearer and eyewitness of the holy apostles, but he tells us that he received the truths of our religion from those who were acquainted with them in the following words. But I shall not be unwilling to put down, along with my interpretation, whatsoever instructions I receive with care at any time from the elders, and store it up with care in my memory, assuring you at the same time of their truth. For I did not, like the multitude, take pleasure in those who spoke much, but in those who taught the truth nor in those who related strange commandments, but in those who rehearsed the commandments given by the Master to faith, and proceeding from truth itself. If then, any one who had attended on the elders came, I asked minutely after their sayings, what Andrew or Peter said, or what was said by Philip, or by Thomas, or by James, or by John, or by Matthew, or by any other of the Master's disciples, which things Aristion and the presbyter John, the disciples of the Master, say. For I imagine that what was to be got from books was not so profitable to me as what came from the living and abiding voice. Second reading. The early believers called those who practice a godly guilelessness children as stated by Apopheus in the first book of the Lord's Expositions, and by Clemens Alexandrinus in his Heidegogue. Reading 3. Judas walked about in this world a sad example of impiety, for his body having swollen to such an extent that he could not pass where a chariot could, where a chariot could pass easily, he was crushed by the chariot so that his bowels gushed out. Reading 4. As the elders who saw John the disciple of the Master remembered that they had heard from him, how the Master taught in regards to those times, and said, The days will come in, which vine shall grow, having each ten thousand branches, and in each branch ten thousand twigs, and in each true twig ten thousand shoots and in every one of the shoots ten thousand clusters, and on every one of the clusters ten thousand grapes, and every grape when pressed will give five and twenty metrates of wine. And when any one of the saints shall lay hold of a cluster, and others shall cry out, I am a better cluster, take me, bless the master through me. In like manner, he said, that a grain of wheat would produce ten thousand ears, and that every ear would have ten thousand grains, and every grain would yield ten pounds of clear, pure, fine flour, and that apples and seeds and grass would produce in similar proportions, and that all animals, feeding then only on the productions of the earth, would become peaceable and harmonious, and be in perfect subjection to man." Unquote. Testimony is borne to these things by writing in Papias, an ancient man who was a hearer of John and a friend of Polycarp, in the fourth of his books, for five books were composed by him. And he added, saying, Now these things are credible to believers. And Judas the traitor, says he, not believing and asking, How shall such growths be accomplished by the Master? The Master said, They shall see who shall come to him, these then are the times mentioned by the prophet Isaiah, and the wolf shall lie down with the lamb. Reading 5. As the overseers say, then those who are deemed worthy of an abode in heaven shall go there. Others shall enjoy the delights of paradise, and others shall possess the splendor of the city. For everywhere the Savior will be seen, according as they shall be worthy who see him. But that there is no distinction between the habitation of those who produce a hundredfold, and that of those who produce sixtyfold, and that of those who produce thirtyfold, for the first will be taken up into the heavens, and the second class will dwell in paradise, and the last will inhabit the city. And that on this account the Master said, In my Father's house are many mansions, for all things belong to Elohim, who supplies all with a suitable dwelling place, even as his word says, the share is given to all by 
the Father, according as each one is or shall be worthy. And this is the couch in which they shall recline who feast, being invited to the wedding. The overseers, the disciples of the apostles, say that this is the gradation and arrangement of those who are saved, and that they shall advance through steps of this nature, and that, moreover, they ascend through the Spirit to the Son, and through the Son to the Father, and that in due time the Son will yield up his work to the Father, even as it is said by the apostle, for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For in the times of the kingdom, the just man who is on the earth shall forget to die. But when he says all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that Elohim may be all in all. Reading 6. Papias, who is now mentioned by us, affirms that he received the sayings of the apostles from those who accompanied them. And he moreover asserts that he heard in person Aristion and the presbyter John. Accordingly, he mentions them frequently by name, and in his writings gives their traditions. Our notice of these circumstances may not be without its use. It may also be worthwhile to add to the statements of Papias already given. Other passages of his in which he relates some miraculous deeds stating that he acquired the knowledge of them from tradition. The residence of the Apostle Philip with his daughters in Hierapolis has been mentioned above. We must now point out how Papias, who lived at the same time, relates that he had received a wonderful narrative from the daughters of Philip, where he relates that a dead man was raised to life in his day. He also mentions another miracle relating to Justice, surnamed Barsabas, how he swallowed a deadly poison and received no harm on account of the favor of the sovereign. The same person, moreover, has set down other things as coming to him from unwritten tradition, among these some strange parables and instructions of the Savior, and some other things of a more fabulous nature. Among these he says that there will be a millennium after the resurrection from the dead, when the personal reign of Messiah will be established on this earth. He moreover hands down, in his own writing, other narratives given by the previously mentioned Aristion of the Master's sayings and the traditions of the overseer John. For information on these points, we can merely refer our readers to the books themselves, but now, to the extracts already made, we shall add, as being a matter of primary importance, a tradition regarding Mark, who wrote the Gospel, which he, Papias, has given in the following words. And the overseer said this, Mark, having become the interpreter of Peter, wrote down accurately whatsoever he remembered. It was not, however, in exact order that he related the sayings and deeds of Messiah, for he neither heard the Master nor accompanied him. But afterwards, as I said, he accompanied Peter, who accommodated his instructions to the necessity of his hearers, but with no intention of giving a regular narrative of the Master's sayings. Wherefore, Mark made no mistake in thus writing some things as he remembered them, for of one thing he took special care, not to omit anything that he had heard, and not to put anything fictitious in the statements. This is what is related by Papias regarding Mark, but with regard to Matthew, he has made the following statements. Matthew put together the oracles of the Master in the Hebrew language, and each one interpreted them as best he could. The same person uses proofs from the first epistle of John, and from the epistle of Peter in like manner, and he also gives another story of a woman who was accused of many sins before the Master, which is to be found in the Gospel according to the Hebrews. Reading 7, Papias thus speaks word for word, to some of them, that is angels, he gave dominion over the arrangement of the world, and he commissioned them to exercise their dominion well, and he says, immediately after this, but it happened that their arrangement came to nothing. Reading 8, with regard to the inspiration of the book of Revelation, we deem it superfluous to add another word, for the blessed Gregory Theologists and Kirill, and even men of still older date, Papias, Irenaeus, Methodius, and Hippolytus, bore entirely satisfactory testimony to it. Reading 9. 
taking occasion from Papias of Hierapolis, the illustrious, a disciple of the apostle who leaned on the bosom of Messiah, and Clemens and Pantinus, the priests of the assembly of the Alexandrians, and the wise Ammonius, the ancient and first expositors who agreed with each other, who understood the work of the six days as referring to Messiah and the whole assembly. Reading 10. Mary, the mother of the master. Mary, the wife of Cleopas or Alphaeus, who was the mother of James, the bishop and apostle, and of Simon and Thaddeus, and of one Joseph. Mary Salome, wife of Zebedee, mother of John, the evangelist, and James. Mary Magdalene. These four are found in the gospel. James and Judas and Joseph were the sons of an aunt of the masters. James also and John were sons of another aunt of the masters. Mary, mother of James the Less and Joseph, wife of Alphaeus, was the sister of Mary, the mother of the master, whom John names of Cleophas, either from her father or from the family of the clan or for some other reason. Mary Salome is called Salome either from her husband or her village. Some affirm that she is the same as Mary of Cleophas because she had two husbands. And that ends the reading of the fragments of Papias. Here is the epistle of Ptolemy, P-T-O-L-E-M-Y. It's dated to about 140. Ptolemy was considered to be a Gnostic. However, I am not sure that it is apparent in this letter. He's writing to his sister concerning her questions about the law, that is the Torah, and he makes a rather firm conclusion. The law was ordained through Moses, my dear sister Flora, has not been understood by many persons who have accurate knowledge neither of him who ordained it nor of his commandments. I think that this will be perfectly clear to you when you have learned the contradictory opinions about it. Some say that it is legislation given by Elohim the Father. Others, taking the contrary course, maintain stubbornly that it was ordained by the opposite, the devil, who causes destruction, just as they attribute the fashioning of the world to him, saying that he is the father and maker of this universe. Both are completely in error. They refuse each other, and neither has reached the truth of the matter. For it is evident that the Torah was not ordained by the perfect Elohim, the Father, for it is secondary, being imperfect and in need of completion by another, containing commandments alien to the nature and thought of such an Elohim. On the other hand, one cannot impute the Torah to the injustice of the opposite, Elohim, for it is opposed to injustice. Such persons do not comprehend what was said by the Savior. For a house or city divided against itself cannot stand, declared our Savior. Furthermore, the Apostle says the creation of the world is due to him. For everything was made through him, and apart from him nothing was made. Thus he takes away in advance the baseless wisdom of the false accusers, and shows that the creation is not due to an Elohim who corrupts, but to the one who is just and hates evil. Only unintelligent men have this idea, men who do not recognize the providence of the Creator and have blinded not only the eye of the soul, but also of the body. From what has been said, it is evident that these persons entirely miss the truth. Each of the two groups has experienced this, the first because they do not know the Elohim of justice, the second because they do not know the Father of all, who alone was revealed by him who alone came. It remains for us who have been counted worthy of the knowledge of both these to provide you with an accurate explanation of the nature of the Torah and the legislator by whom it was ordained. We shall draw the proofs of what we say from the words of the Savior, which alone can lead us without error to the comprehension of reality. First, you must learn that the entire Torah contained in the Pentateuch of Moses was not ordained by one legislator, I mean, not by Elohim alone. Some commandments are Moses, and some were given by other men. The words of the Savior teach us this triple division. The first part must be attributed to Elohim alone and his legislation. We'll be right back after these dandy messages. 
Let's return to the boring letter of Ptolemy to his sister, an ancient text. The second to Moses, not in the sense that Elohim legislates through him, but in the sense that Moses gave some legislation under the influence of his own ideas. And the third to the elders of the people, who seem to have ordained some commandments of their own at the beginning. You will now learn how the truth of this theory is proved by the words of the Savior. In some discussion with those who dispute with the Savior about divorce, which was permitted in the Torah, he said, Because of your hard-heartedness, Moses permitted a man to divorce his wife. From the beginning it was not so, for Elohim made this marriage, and, and what Yahweh joined together, man must not separate. In this way, he shows there is a Torah of Elohim, which prohibits the divorce of a wife from a husband, and another law, that of Moses, which permits the breaking of this yoke because of hard-heartedness. In fact, Moses lays down legislation contrary to that of Elohim, for joining is contrary to not joining. But if we examine the intention of Moses in giving this legislation, it will be seen that he did not give it arbitrarily or of his own accord, but by the necessity because of the weakness of those whom the legislation was given. Since they were unable to keep the intention of Elohim, according to which it was not lawful for them to reject their wives, with whom some of them disliked to live, and therefore were in danger of turning to a greater injustice and thence to destruction, Moses wanted to remove the cause of dislike, which was placing them in jeopardy of destruction. Therefore, because of the critical circumstances, choosing a lesser evil in place of a greater, he ordained on his own accord a second law, that of divorce, so that if they could not observe the first, they might keep this and not turn to unjust and evil act through which complete destruction would be the result for them. This was his intention when he gave legislation contrary to that of Elohim. Therefore, it is indisputable that here the Torah of Moses is different from the Torah of Elohim, even if we have demonstrated the fact from only one example. The Savior also makes plain the fact that there are some traditions of elders interwoven in the Torah. For Elohim, he says, said, Honor your father and your mother that it may be well with you. But you, he says addressing the elders, have declared as a gift to Elohim that by which you have nullified the Torah of Elohim through the tradition of your elders. Isaiah also proclaimed this, saying, This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me, teaching precepts which are the commandments of men. Therefore, it is obvious that the whole Torah is divided into three parts. We find in it the legislation of Moses, of the elders, and of Elohim himself. This division of the entire Torah, as made by us, has brought to light what is true in it. This part, the Torah of Elohim himself, is in turn divided into three parts. The pure legislation not mixed with evil, which properly called Torah, which the Savior came not to destroy but to complete. For what he completed was not alien to him, but needed completion, for it did not possess perfection. Next, the legislation interwoven with the inferiority and injustice which the Savior destroyed because it was alien to his nature, and finally, the legislation which is allegorical and symbolic, an image of what is spiritual and transcendent, while the Savior transferred from the perceptible and phenomenal to the spiritual and invisible. The Torah of Elohim, pure and not mixed with inferiority, is the Decalogue. Those ten sayings engraved on two tablets, forbidding things not to be done and enjoining things to be done. These contain pure but imperfect legislation and required the completion made by the Savior. There is also the Torah interwoven with injustice, laid down for vengeance and the requital of previous injuries, ordaining that an eye should be cut out for an eye and a tooth for a tooth and that a murder should be avenged by a murder. The person who is the second one to be unjust is no less unjust than the first. He simply changes the order of events while performing the same action. 
Admittedly, this commandment was a just one and still is just because of the weakness of those for whom the legislation was made so they would not transgress the pure Torah. But it is alien to the nature and goodness of the Father of all. No doubt it was appropriate to the circumstances or even necessary. But he who does not want one murder committed, saying, You shall not kill, and then commanded a murder to be repaid by another murder, has given a second Torah which enjoins two murders, although he had forbidden one. This fact proves that he was unsuspectingly the victim of necessity. This is why, when the sun came, he destroyed this part of the Torah while admitting that it came from Elohim. He counts this part of the Torah as in the old religion, not only in other passages, but also where he said, Elohim said, He who curses father or mother shall surely die. Finally, there is the allegorical, exemplary part, ordained in the image of the spiritual and transcendent matters. I mean the part dealing with offerings and circumcision, and the Sabbath, and fasting, and Passover, and unleavened bread, and other similar matters. Since all these things are images and symbols, when the truth was made manifest, they were translated to another meaning. In their phenomenal appearance, in their literal application, they were destroyed. But in their spiritual meaning, they were restored. The names remained the same, but the content was changed. Thus the Savior commanded us to make offerings not of irrational animals, or of the incense of this worldly sort, but of spiritual praise and glorification and thanksgiving, and of sharing and well-doing with our neighbors. He wanted us to be circumcised, not in regard to our physical foreskin, but in regard to our spiritual heart, to keep the Sabbath, for he wishes us to be idle in regards to evil works. To fast, not in physical fasting, but in spiritual, in which there is abstinence from everything evil. Among us, external fasting is also observed, since it can be advantageous to the soul if it is done reasonably, not for imitating others or from habit or because of a special day appointed for this purpose. It is also observed so that those who are not yet able to keep the true fast may have a reminder of it from the external fast. Similarly, Paul the Apostle shows that the Passover and the unleavened bread are images when he says, Messiah, our Passover has been sacrificed in order that you may be unleavened bread, not containing leaven, and by leaven he here means evil, but may be a new lump. Thus the Torah of Elohim itself is obviously divided into three parts. The first was completed by the Savior for the commandment, You shall not kill, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not swear falsely, are included in the forbidding of anger, desire, and swearing. The second part was entirely destroyed, for an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, interwoven with injustice, was destroyed by the Savior through its opposite. Opposites cancel out. For I say to you, do not resist the evil man, but if anyone strikes you, turn the other cheek to him. Finally, there is the part translated and changed from the literal to the spiritual, this symbolic legislation, which is an image of transcendent things. For the images and symbols that represent other things were good as long as the truth has not come. But since the truth has come, we must perform the actions of the truth, not those of the image. The disciples of the Savior and the Apostle Paul show that this theory is true. Speaking of the part dealing with images, as we have already said in mentioning the Passover for us and the unleavened bread, for the Torah interwoven with injustice when he says, the law of commandments and ordinances were destroyed, Ephesians 2.15, and of that not mixing with anything inferior when he says that, the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and just and good. I think I have shown you sufficiently, as well as one can in brief compass, the addition of human legislation in the Torah, and the triple division of the Torah of Elohim itself. It remains for us to say who this Elohim is who ordained the Torah, but I think this too has been shown you in what we have already said, if you have listened to it attentively. For if the Torah was not ordained by the perfect Elohim himself, as we have already thought you, as we have already taught you, nor by the devil, a statement one cannot possibly make, the legislator must be someone other than these two. In fact, 
He is the demiurge and maker of this universe and everything in it. And because he is essentially different from these two and is between them, he is rightly given the name intermediate. And if the perfect Elohim is good by nature, in fact he is, for our Savior declared that there is only a single good Elohim, his Father whom he manifested, and if the one who is the opposite nature is evil and wicked, characterized by injustice, then the one situated between the two is neither good nor evil, nor unjust, but can properly be called just, since he is the arbitrator of the justice which is his. On the one hand, this Elohim will be inferior to the perfect Elohim, and the lower than his justice, since he is generated and not ungenerated. There is only one ungenerated Father from whom are all things, since all things depend on him in their own ways. On the other hand, he will be greater and more powerful than the adversary by nature, since he has a substance of either of them. The substance of the adversary is corruption and darkness, for he is material and complex, while the substance of the ungenerated father of all is incorruptible and self-existent light, simple and homogeneous. The substance of the latter produced a double power, while the Savior is an image of the greater one. And now, do not let this trouble you for the present in your desire to learn how from one first principle of all, simple and acknowledged by us and believed by us, ungenerated and incorruptible substances, although it is characteristic of the good to generate and produce things that are like itself and have the same substance. For if Elohim permit, you will later learn about their origin and generation. When you're judged worthy of the apostolic tradition, which we too have received by succession, we too are able to prove all our points by the teaching of the Savior. In making these brief statements to you, my sister Flora, I have not grown weary, and while I have treated the subject with brevity, I have also discussed it sufficiently. These points will be of great benefit to you in the future. It is like fair and good ground you have received fertile seeds and go on to show forth their fruit. This is a great exposition on the part of Ptolemy, but I must admit he is a Gnostic to some extent. He, if he didn't understand that last 10 minutes or so, he's talking about the contrast between Elohim, the good one, and the Demiurge, the bad one. They understand that there's a high father that's good and a low creator that's not good. And the low creator created everything on the earth and nothing's good. So their intention is always to bypass the creator and go to the higher God, the higher good. But other than that theology we find in there, I thought it's all very sound advice to me. It's been pretty much shown these days, the tampering with the message of the Torah, and also with every other scripture there. It's been tampered with, and I guess the only way we're going to get the true word is to get it from the Holy Spirit, and understand that the print on the page is not indicative of inspiration. Trust the Spirit. The teaching of Simon Kifa in Rome, an ancient Syriac document. In the third year of Claudius Caesar, Shimon Kifa departed from Antioch to go to Rome, and as he passed on, he preached in the diverse countries the word of our master. And when he had nearly arrived there, many had heard of it and went out to meet him. And the whole assembly received him with great joy. And some of the princes of the city, wearers of the imperial headbands, came to him that they might see him and hear his word. And when the whole city was gathered together about him, he stood up to speak to them and to show them the preaching of his doctrine of what sort it was. And he began to speak to them thus. People of Rome, 
Saints of all Italy, hear ye that which I say to you. This day I preach and proclaim Yahshua, the son of Elohim, who came down from heaven and became man, and was with us as one of ourselves, and wrought marvelous mighty works and signs and wonders before us, and before all the Jews that were in the land of Palestine. And you yourselves also heard of these things which he did, because they came to him from all other countries also, on account of the fame of his healing and the report of the marvelous help he gave, and whosoever drew near to him was healed by his word. And inasmuch as he was Elohim, at the same time that he healed, he also forgave sins. For his healing, which was open to view, bore witness of his hidden forgiveness, that it was real and trustworthy. For this Yahshua did the prophets announce in their mysterious sayings, as they were looking forward to see him and to hear his word, him who was with his Father from eternity and from everlasting, Elohim, who was hidden in the height, and appeared in the depth the glorious Son, who was from his progenitor, and is to be glorified together with his Father, and his divine Spirit, and the terrible power of his dominion. And he was crucified of his own will by the hands of sinners, and was taken up to his Father, even as I and my companions saw. And he is about to come again in his own glory, and that of his holy angels, even as we heard him say to us. For we cannot say anything which was not heard by us from him. Neither do we write in the book of his gospel anything which he himself did not say to us, because this word is spoken in order that the mouth of liars may be shut in the day when men shall give an account of idle words at the place of judgment. Moreover, because we were catchers of fish, and not skilled in books, Therefore did he also say to us, I will send you the Spirit, the paraclete, that he may teach you that which you know not. For it is by his gift that we speak those things that you hear, and further, by it we bring aid to the sick, and healing to the diseased, that by the hearing of his word, and by the aid of his power, ye may believe in Messiah, that he is Elohim, and the Son of Elohim, and may be delivered from the service of bondage, and may worship him and his Father, and glorify his divine Spirit. For when we glorify the Father, we glorify the Son also with him, and when we worship the Son, we worship the Father also with him, and when we confess the Spirit, we confess the Father also and the Son, because in the name of the Father also is the Son, because in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Spirit, were we commanded to baptize those who believe, that they may live forever. Flee, therefore, from the words of wisdom of this world, and in which there is no profit, and draw near to those which are true and faithful and acceptable before Elohim, whose reward also is laid up in store, and whose recompense standeth sure. Now, too, the light has arisen on the creation, and the world has obtained the eyes of the mind, that every man may see and understand, that it is not fit that creatures should be worshipped instead of the Creator, nor together with the Creator, because everything which is a creature is made to be worshipper of its Maker, and is not to be worshipped like its Creator. But this one who came to us is Elohim, the Son of Elohim, in his own nature, notwithstanding that he mingled his Elohim with our manhood, in order that he might renew our manhood by the aid of his Elohim. And on this account it is right that we should worship him, because he is to be worshipped together with his Father, and we should not worship creatures who were created for the worship of the Creator. For he is himself the Elohim of truth and verity. He is himself from before all worlds and creatures. He is himself the veritable Son, and the glorious fruit which is from the exalted Father.
But ye see the wonderful works which accompany and follow these words. One would not credit it. The time, lo, is short since he ascended to his Father. And see how his gospel has winged its flight through the whole creation, that thereby it might be known and believed that he himself is the creator of creatures, and that by his bidding creatures subsist. And whereas ye saw the sun become darkened at his death, Ye yourselves also are witnesses. The earth, moreover, quaked when he was slain, and the veil was rent at his death. And concerning these things the governor Pilate also was witness, for he himself sent and made them known to Caesar. And these things, and more than these, were read before him and before the princes of your city. And on this account, Caesar was angry against Pilate, because he had unjustly listened to the persuasion of the Jews. And for this reason he sent and took away from him the authority which he had given to him. And this same thing was published and known in all the dominion of the Romans. That, therefore, which Pilate saw and made known to Caesar, and to your honorable senate, the same do I preach and declare, as do also my fellow apostles. And ye know that Pilate could not have written to the imperial government of that which did not take place and which he had not seen with his own eyes, but that which did take place and was actually done. This it was he wrote and made known. Moreover, the watchers of the sepulchre also were witnesses of those things that took place there. They became as dead men. And when those watchers were questioned before Pilate, they confessed before him how large a bribe the chief priests of the Jews had given them, so that they might say that we his disciples had stolen the corpse of Messiah. Lo then! Ye have heard many things, and moreover, if ye be not willing to be persuaded by those things that ye have heard, be at least persuaded by the mighty works which ye see, which are done by his name. Let not Simon the sorcerer delude you by semblances which are not realities, which he exhibits to you as to men who have no understanding, who know not how to discern that which they see and hear. Send, therefore, and fetch him to where all your city is assembled together, and choose you some sign for us to do before you. And whichever ye see do that same sign, it will be your part to believe in it. And immediately they sent and fetched Simon the sorcerer. And the men who were adherents of his opinion said to him, As a man concerning whom we have confidence there is power in thee to do anything whatsoever, do thou some sign before us all, and let this Simon the Galilean, who preaches Messiah, see it. And whilst they were thus speaking to him, there happened to be passing along a dead person, a son of one of the renown among them. And all of them, as they were assembled together, said to him, Whichever of you shall restore to life this dead person, he is true, and to be believed in and received, and we will all follow him in whatsoever he saith to us. And they said to Simon the sorcerer, Because thou wast here before Simon the Galilean, and we knew the before him, exhibit thou first the power which accompanieth thee. Then Simon reluctantly drew near to the dead person, and they set down the beer before him, and he looked to the right hand, and he looked to the left hand, and he gazed up into heaven, saying many words. Some of them he uttered aloud, and some of them secretly, and not aloud. And he delayed a long while, and nothing took place, and nothing thing was done, and the dead person was lying upon the bier. And forthwith Simon Kepha drew near boldly toward the dead man, and cried aloud before there all the assembled which was standing there, in the name of Yahshua HaMashiach, whom the Jews crucified at Jerusalem, and whom we preach, rise up thence. And as soon as the word of Simon was spoken, the dead man came to life and rose up from the bier. And all the people saw and marveled, and they said to Simon, Messiah, whom thou preachest, is true. And many cried out and said, Let Simon the sorcerer and the deceiver of us all be stoned. But Simon, by reason that everyone was running to see the dead man that was come to life, escaped from them from one street to another, 
turn from one house to another, and fell not into their hands on that day. But the whole city took hold of Simon Kepha, and they received him gladly and affectionately, and he ceased not from doing signs and wonders in the name of Messiah, and many believed in him. Cuprinus, moreover, the father of him that was restored to life, took Simon with him to his home, and entertained him in a suitable manner, and he and all his household believed on Messiah, that he is the son of the living Elohim. We are so sorry to interrupt program, but I am afraid we are out of time, Havarim. May Yahweh bless you and keep you close to home. <laughs>